join me in welcoming Dr. Oliver Sinderman. Thank you, Knaz. Okay, let's kick off. So, um, when I came to Singapore about 10 years uh, ago for the first time, um, I was taken to uh, a psychiatric ward in one of the um, national, um, national hospitals. I'm not going to say which hospital, but it was a real wake-up call for me at the time. My wife is in Singapore and it was clear I had to come here at some point. I was like, oh my God, the patients were wearing the same gowns. They were heavily medicated and I was just thinking, oh, we have so much to do in this country. Now, 10 years on, we've come a very, very long way. I was previously, before joining Intellect, I was um, in NUS, um, Faculty of um, Arts and Social Science, as a clinical psychologist, and I met Theodoric, our CEO, about four years ago. And I was absolutely hooked on his idea to create a more accessible, affordable mental health care system, having that image in mind from some years before. And... I was particularly excited to join Intellect because Theo was committed from day one, and I probably wouldn't have joined otherwise, um, to invest in the science behind what we do. Um, so we're very, very fortunate. We have a clinical uh, team. We have a research team, um, which I oversee. And from day one, we invested heavily in what we do. And I was a little naive when we started. I thought, okay, we'll just do randomized controlled trials. Most of our research with, is with NUS. I'm very proud of that because we're very rigorous in what we do, but I just thought we just do efficacy studies and we just prove things, uh, what we do works. When I joined Intellect and I was looped in some of the sales calls and uh, very proud of our clinical solution and one of the main sort of challenges we encountered was we love what you do guys, but don't want to pay. Maybe $10 per employee per year. And I was like, what? Isn't that such an obvious thing? How can it like not be a good investment in your employees' mental health? But that's the reality. And the uh, HR folks here in the room of you, they, they'll know there are other vendors out there and there's, you know, tenders go out there and there's a competition. It's a, it's a bit of a race to the bottom. And it's quite sad because to me as a clinical psychologist, it was so obvious that this is a good investment. So then we advanced our research and I was like, okay, so we have to obviously prove to the CEOs uh, and to the people leader that this actually is a good investment. So how do we do this? So that's what this talk is gonna be about. So in the next 10, 15 minutes or so, I will tell you why investing um, in your employees' mental well-being using a science-backed solution is one of the best investments you can make. If you bring your money to the bank, you get maybe 3%. Bear with me, you'll, you'll see in a second what you get out of when you invest in intellect. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Always good to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then afterwards I'll tell you what I told you. <laughs> so we'll cover the hidden cost of mental health first. Briefly touch on traditional EAPs. They're very well intended, but they come with some problems. And then I'll share with you the solution. Okay, so just a little bit of history. EAPs have been around for a very, very long time. I won't go into much depth here, but what I do say is... Um, in the 1950s in Wall Street, um, AA, AA was uh, founded to help with occupational drinking problems. And then a few years later, the first sort of traditional EAP was launched where families were given um, access to um, counseling, legal counseling and support, but it was quite reactive at the time. And then fast forward um, to the 2000s, um, then private EAPs really, you know, they, they sprung up like mushrooms. In a, in a Singaporean forest. <laughs> and, um, but they were still quite reactive. A helpline was given 24-7 sort of distress support. Very, very good, but still very reactive. And then just a few years back, um, in the pandemic, after the pandemic, we saw more digital EAPs um, rising and um, offering a bit more of a proactive solution, giving self-care content, allowing people to work proactively on their mental health. And we had the insurers speak earlier. My Really, my, my hope and wish for our insurance landscape is that we incentivize proactive mental health uh, care, of course. Um, but as I just shared with you, that wasn't enough, really. Um, we need to really prove that this is a good investment. Okay, so this is a study um, interacted with Milieu um, Insight uh, last year. It made frontline news. Um, we surveyed um, 3,000 workers in the Philippines, Singapore, and Indonesia. And... Um, 
across those three countries, mental health wasn't very good. Um, as I'm sure you're not surprised, you already knew that. Um, we already heard um, Antia was speaking earlier about our long working hours, which we found was linked um, to obviously um, poorer sleep and poorer quality of life. The interesting thing was here that um, the Singaporean workers, uh, about a third of them, they were motivated by the fact of not keeping up with their peers. So this study was shedding a bit of light on the um, glamorization um, of the hustle culture we have here in this country so much. And uh, I don't need to give you another burnout statistics. We've, we've seen this. You're not surprised, right? It's, uh, it's a known problem. I saw this in Antia's slides earlier as well. So very briefly, this was a landmark study by um, IMH and Duke NUS um, that tried to put a money, a uh, dollar value to the cost of mental health problems uh, in companies. And what they found is that about 14% of the uh, around 5,000 workers or so they surveyed, they had symptoms consistent with depression and high overlap with anxiety as well. Now, understandably, um, those workers, they take sick leave because they struggle, right? So that came with a cost of around $5,000. But the real surprise of this study was the hidden cost. People coming to work, but struggling. So it's hard to see. They, they, they're just not at their best, right? And we touched on this before. It's a you know, productivity um, drops, and um, that actually came with a much, much higher cost. So that's the real shocker, I think, here, that people coming to work, but they're not functioning, and they're, they're not doing very well. Okay, so now we set the context. So what is part of the problem? So traditional EAPs... Um, are very, very well intended. Of course they are. Um, but the problem is they're kind of built for non-utilization. That's why they're so cheap. And so on the surface level, they're quite attractive. But, you know, traditional EAPs, what do they do? So they give access to a helpline. That's good. But often the helpline is not localized. So you may not speak to a responder who is trained. There's often a callback. You have to wait. Now, if you're feeling suicidal, that's a real issue. You can't really wait for someone to call you back. So ideally, the responders are trained. Um, culturally nuanced, uh, the, sorry, the, the, um, a lot of the responders are not trained in a culturally nuanced way. And so really it's a band aid and you can't really shift the culture of a company. You have to, as we heard earlier, have to work with the leaders. You have to really work with a framework like the one from NUS to come, you know, multimodal and multiple layers. You can't just fix mental health with an EAP. And the other problem related to that is that um, adoption is now especially in recent years, we heard this a lot, you know, especially the new players, they shout about, oh, we're utilized a lot more. And, and we do that too. Of course, if no one is using your solution, then you can't really change the person's mental health or you can't really improve it. But is that really what you need to know at the board level, whether people are using your solution? So what organization outcomes are you really looking for? Is it just that the solution gets used? Is that what you're looking for? Is it utility? Um, what is it? So think about it this way. If you have to see your dentist every week, is that, a, is that an indication of, of, of good dental health? Probably not. And the same goes for if you have to have a therapy session every single week or every other day for, for you know, weeks or months on end. It's probably not um, the best indicator that what you're doing works. Okay, so maybe you're not getting or receiving evidence-based care as possible. So let's talk about the metrics that really matter, and let's talk about the science that um, drives those. So this is the um, intellect model, and I'll briefly walk you through those layers, and then I give a bit more meat to um, each layer as well. So at the bottom, when you adopt a well-being solution that is comprehensive, you first want to know whether it works, okay? Whether it does what it says it does. Does it lift up your staff's mental health? So we're looking at mental health literacy. Excuse me. Does it reduce stress? Does it reduce burnout risk? Um, does it you know, lower depression, anxiety, and so on, okay? Um, and you want to have proof, ideally, from peer-reviewed research. So this, um, these are studies um, um, in the academic world where you have other professors with a magnifying glass, they're kind of dissecting what you're doing. They're very strict. And if you manage to publish your research in, the, in such journals, that's really 
a quality stem um, that what you do actually works. So ideally you want that. Okay, that's level one. Now level two is more holistic well-being. Okay, so mental health on its own is only part of um, um, mental well-being as we know, right? There's financial well-being, there's uh, spiritual well-being um, and so on. Um, and there's resilience as well. So physical health and mental health, of course, the, you know, is tightly linked. We all know that. So does that, does your study also, sorry, does your program also drive resilience and physical health, nutrition and so on? Okay, that's the second layer. So more holistic resilience approach. And thirdly, this is for the boardroom, for the HR leaders. These are the metrics you already know from your pulse surveys, your engagement surveys. Um, what is it that, you know, matters to you. We heard about retention, turnover, loyalty to the company, and so on. Okay, productivity, absenteeism, etc. And this is where the RI sits as well. So very, very briefly, most of our research is done, as I said, in partnership with NUS. Um, we have other partnerships as well. Across the board, we find that our solution really does seem to make a difference to people. And I'm super proud to share this with you. I don't have time to go into much depth, but all of those studies, they're published and um, you can access them on our website or you can also ping me. I'll, I'll, I'll share those with you. Um, so just very briefly, we, we looked at body image and self-compassion. We did a study in NUS. Um, another one looked at stress uh, reduction, stress coping, um, anxiety and worry as well. Um, and this study is just um, hot off the press as well. Um, so this is our own data where we found that um, using our solution, uh, coaching in particular, really drives good organizational outcomes. Okay, coming on to layer two, um, resilience. This is a study we did last year in, in, in partnership with um, an insurer. Um, and um, we looked at whether proactively taking care of your mental health leads to actually improvements in your resilience. And the short answer is yes, it does. So even using the app and working on your sleep or, you know, doing a mindfulness meditation or doing some um, uh, journaling, for example, you can see on the next day. So we're a technology company, right? We're very data driven. So we pick up on those changes and we manage to publish that. So that's really strong proof that resilience actually the next day um, seems to you know, be improved. And lastly, let's talk about level three. Um, I have to take a quick step back here. So when we were talking about um, productivity and ROI, so first of all, um, let's talk about the individual, the employee, right? So we give them access to um, our solution, uh, multimodal channel, but let's use the app here for simplicity. And we have developed intellect dimensions. Theo spoke about it in his opening um, talk. Um, basically, this is a 26 um, item engaging um, short survey employees can do on their phone and it touches on a holistic sort of spectrum of mental health. We are, we are asking about um, resilience, sleep, um, stress, uh, anxiety, depression, but also um, growth mindset, self-efficacy and organizational outcomes. How satisfied are you in your job? Um, are you intending to leave the company? What is the perceived stigma you have? Um, and so on. And the employee, they get personalized recommendations um, of, you know, based on the results, what are your areas of strength and what are your areas of growth? And we help them to match with a coach to work on those areas or if the risk is low, um, we may recommend self-guided content. Okay, that's for the employee. And they can visually track their progress as well with their coaches or on their own. And uh, Theo also earlier showed uh, you guys the, the dashboard. So we aggregate that data um, uh, confidentially um, for HR to see. But interesting, let's, let's talk about the, we said this was going to be on investment, right? So let's talk about the RI. We're using the data from, um, from this quiz to look at productivity and absenteeism, okay? And um, we're assessing productivity as a function of anxiety, job satisfaction. This is all research back. Someone who has better mood, they're going to be more productive. They're going to be working more effectively. And we're asking directly whether people have missed a day at work because of mental health or physical problems. So I'm super excited to share with you 
that we've just finished our internal ROI study um, and we found a staggering return on investing $1 returns actually 14x. Now, you're rightly skeptical and I'm very happy to, to share with you the technical papers we have to look at this. And um, so basically what we did here is we looked at the changes in mental health improvement. We translated that to productivity and then we looked at the salaries and we looked at the, the dollar cost savings. Okay, so simple example, if you take $1,000 and the person is 10% more productive, then you can kind of argue you're getting 10% more out of this, this person, right? So this is kind of the, the, the logic behind it. And more importantly, if you work with a coach, you get almost double the ROI. And that is because we're obviously, we're humans, we're creatures of habit. It's hard for us to change. If we work with a coach as much, we're accountable to someone and it's, it, it's usually easier to change our habits and work towards better mental health. Um, so yeah, for more details, happy to, or grab me in the, um, the break. Now, we're taking this one step further. So when we partner with companies, we allow to benchmark as well. This is um, fictitious data. I didn't want to share the real data. We partner with NUS and um, we did this um, Intellect Dimensions Personal Insight Quiz and we benchmarked against other university so that NUS gets insight how their staff compare um, the industry standard. And then together with their team and our organizational psychologists, we can make recommendations uh, based on those results. And that's my last slide. I just wanted to also, Bob has already covered it. Um, I just wanted to say that the science, we, the, the studies we do, uh, intellect and at NUS and so on, that's obviously very important to, to demonstrate that what we do actually works. But as Bob has shared, if you really want to make a difference, you need to work at the policy level. And many of our clients here have um, office staff across ASEAN, not just in Singapore. So um, we are looking, as Bob had shared earlier, we're looking at um, to conduct a white paper and we'll be reaching out to some of you as well to partner with us on this. Um, we're planning two things, as Bob has shared earlier, in a, in a nutshell. We want to inform policy change across ASEAN, not just in Singapore. And we heard from Antti already that good things are already happening, but we have to really look at the, 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 the you know, multinational, the wider context. That's one policy change. And we want to give a framework of recommended corporate mental well-being um, strategies that are evidence-based. Of course, yoga lunches, wellness classes is all fantastic, but you need to really consider the evidence base. So we're putting it all together and we're going to present um, the data as Bob shared next year at various conferences as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, and I believe we're going to have a panel now. So no, sorry, one more slide to just put it all together. Okay, so in summary, um, we talked about the hidden cost of mental health challenges. There's rising awareness, great, but there is still a hidden cost and we've seen this in the Duke um, NUS and IMH study. Traditional EAPs fall short because they're not used and they report utilization data, not so much the outcomes that matter. And finally, the power of science-backed uh, solutions um, is actually is very important because if, if what you adopt in your company doesn't work, then you're not really shifting the needle for your employees. So make sure that what you're using is science-backed and gives you in-depth insight, the data, so you can, that you can you know, react to it and deploy proactively. So if you see that your sales team is having higher risk of burnout, you want to be proactive about that. Okay? Okay, so that's right. it. So thank you so much for your attention and we have a panel now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. So Dr. Oliver, you can remain on stage. I will now like to invite our esteemed panelists to join us. We have Mr. Lutfi Ghani, Human Resources Director, Singapore and Malaysia, Kuna Nagel, as well as Ms. Hina Bose, Deputy CEO, Pacific Prime, uh, and we moderating this session will be Frank Intellects, VP of Marketing. Let's give them a round of applause, shall we? Thank you. Those were some big numbers, but let's let's take a step back as well. And we are really glad to invite both Hina and Lutfi with us today 
and you know, share a bit about what they have seen in their workplaces, in your work with clients, or as an in-house practitioner. I think we are really glad to have both an in-house as well as a client-facing practitioner with decades of experience here. Now, I'd like to kick off with a simple question. So let's see how this works. Ah, yes. So first question actually may be going off the script a little. I'd like to invite you to maybe share a, a bit about a fun fact about yourself that uh, some people in the audience may not know. So maybe we can start with Hina, if you first, and then Lutfi. Hina? Fun fact is, um, to be managing a team of 200 people, I follow Buddhism myself. So it's been 20 years, and it is very, very important for me to keep um, a sense to create value to not only team and clients. So it helps me to manage my mental wellness. That's my way out. Thanks for sharing that. Lutfi. Um, hi, everyone. So a uh, fun fact about me is uh, that my journey into the world of HR was entirely accidental. Um, I graduated with a degree in advertising and marketing. Uh, but that, that, that values of being able to sell, being able to advertise, I think I've uh, adapted that into the world of HR and it works out well. Thanks. Time for me to maybe consider that. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. So really lovely to, of course, have, you know, Hina, Deputy CEO of Pacific Prime, Lutfi, HR Director at Quinn and Nagel. And, you know, going into our first questions, what we'd like to discuss a bit is, you know, what you're seeing in the workplace firstly, any challenges or impact that your clients or your employees may have seen, and finally, some brief initial thoughts about what Oliver has just shared with us today. So on to the first question. So this is for Hina. Based on your work with Pacific Prime's clients, you know, you have dozens and I'm sure like globally, tons of clients as well. Okay, sorry, that, that screen may just need a bit of a technical refresh. Uh, how have you seen the market demand for mental health services evolve? And if any, how, does, how do you see intellect in the last few years fit in some of those needs that may be required? Thank you, Frank. So each client wellness journey is different. Some might be embarking on EAP services, while these few might be looking for coaching, self-help sessions. Our team tries to understand the client requirements and then customize the plans as per they need. One which is very close to my heart is digital integration. So as an organization, we have created an ecosystem where we connect client data to our in-house tool, which is connected to insurers and well-being partners. So this provides one-stop view. In a nutshell, it simplifies the processes. So what our team is trying to do is collaborate with the intellect team to promote mental health solutions together for clients. Thanks so much for sharing that. So it sounds like you're actually giving the big picture, both mental, but also holistic, physical and medical wellness of your clients' employees. That's, that's really interesting. Now, maybe for, for you, Lutfi, a similar question, but you know, in your context of, and I, I recall as well, you know, Quinn and Argo, I think it was one of the first uh, earlier clients of Intellect backed in two years ago. Drawing from your experience since then, have you seen, you know, could be yourself or the employees that you work with, any elements of the platform that you have found effective? Uh, so my journey with Intellect started back in 2020. Um, back then, I was given uh, instruction by our corporate offices to have an EAP in place. Um, and I, when I researched into EAP, all I needed to know was EAP means uh, a 24 by 7 uh, hotline. Um, Intellect came into my my research um, and that opened my eyes into what Intellect can offer, not just having an AEP in place, but also a lot of proactive uh, well-being uh, uh, features that, that employees can use. Um, the adoption rate was uh, initially a little bit tough because a lot of employees uh, have never been used to having a self-help feature, uh, something like this. So when, when my organization started with Intellect, I think the, the lowest hanging fruit was certainly the coaching sessions or the counseling sessions. Um, it took a bit of effort also to push our employees uh, in utilizing these, creating, um, suggesting use cases, why they should be speaking to a coach of Intellect and not paying for an outside coach elsewhere. Right? So that was, um, I guess, the first hurdle or the first milestone that we, we use on Intellect. The second one was actually the personal insights that came, I think, earlier this year. 
Um, why I thought that was groundbreaking was, I, I think, similar to, to what you shared earlier, the ROIs. Um, mental health cannot be categorized into one single um, KPI or ROI, right? There are so many different elements of what mental well-being is. Uh, and the personal insights breaks that down into many smaller factors. So when employees saw that, you know what, when I'm suffering from mental illness or I'm suffering from challenges in my mental health, that doesn't mean that uh, you're just not good in mental resilience. It could mean a host of factors. So that personal insights break that down into other smaller areas where employees can work from. And they know that, you know what, I'm strong in some, but I'm weaker in others. So to me, that was really groundbreaking. So that employees are able to really use that for their own personal benefit. Thanks for sharing. And I was going to touch on personal insights in my closing remarks, but you've covered everything so I can scrap my speech. Uh, but, but thanks so much for sharing. I think actually important point that you raised and honestly, we also want to be upfront is that not everything is a plug and play as we wish it could be, right? We, we definitely have seen much success in that, but a lot of it will be in that organizational approach where both intellect and the team that we work with, uh, such as yourselves, you know, partner us and drive that education forward. And I think that's what you mentioned earlier and has definitely you know gone a long way since we started as well. Thanks for sharing that. All right, so back to you, Hina. I want to kind of dive a bit deeper into what you mentioned earlier where, you know, Pacific Prime, as you mentioned, tailors kind of the approach for different client needs. Now, maybe just using any one of uh, the different types of solutions, this could be uh, from telehealth coaching and counseling. It could be self-care guided programs such as content and journaling, as well as the EAP helpline. How have you seen these uh, or either or any of these programs fitting into the needs of your clients today? So mental health, um, I mean, internet solutions provide flexibilities to individual and it does fit into their modern lifestyle. They're not only cost effective in comparison with the traditional counseling setup, but also it empowers individuals to take care of their mental wellness. So this sense of self-efficacy is appealing to many individuals. So in nutshell, I'll say the programs gives flexibility, they are cost effective, it empowers individuals, and that's the key. This is appeasing to a lot many individuals who are actually reluctant to go to a traditional counseling setup, especially for those people. That's a great point. So it's essentially you're putting the power back into the employee's hands. You give them the ability to choose the benefits are there, they are educated, and then they, they choose which path, which journey they like to take. Thanks, Fang. Right, so similarly, I would like to, to dive a bit deeper into what you just shared with us, Lutfi. So you talked a bit about the journey and how it's evolved to actually include personal insights this year. Now, I think in one of the first times that we had the chance to meet, uh, you had a, I think I recall quite a deep impression of you sharing some of the impact that you may have seen on the organizational results from intellect to the workplace. So in this next question, uh, we'd we'll love to understand, you know, if you could share a bit more about any organizational impact you, you have seen from utilizing intellect in your past number of years? Uh, so my initially un uh, prepared answer, uh, I had written it down, but I think you just took everything that away because there's now an ROI available. Uh, so, but just imagine my answer was before Dr. Oliver. Um, I struggled to have an ROI in place. I think uh, when I first onboarded with intellect um, and we were pushing them, we were using metrics such as the WHO Wellbeing Index. Um, but that doesn't have a strong correlation towards organizational ROIs. So I think over the past three years, I think uh, I also went on on the journey trying to find or grasp at straws um, on cre linking, you know, this well-being index towards organizational ROI. And and for us, one of the first things that we used was attrition, uh, going deeper into why employees leave us. Uh, and one of the um, one of the KPIs that we have was attrition due to work-life balance. Coming out from the pandemic, I think um, we we saw that there are under in influences towards this particular reason for attrition. But we do we did see a significant drop uh, in those who wanted to leave because of work life balance. And when we did exit interviews mm. um, on why they are leaving, uh, many employees felt that many employees who had left mm. felt that you know they were not supported in trying to achieve work life balance. But then when we did a second research into why employees stayed. Uh, then that's when realized. I wouldn't say for many, but for some, that the name intellect came forward. 
Yeah, uh, because firstly, I think similar to to achieving self-efficacy, they have tools on hand to strengthen their mental resilience. They have tools on hand how to immediately combat stresses at the workplace. In the past, you know what? When I'm stressed, I throw in a resignation letter. But today, when I'm stressed, I'm not going to throw in a resignation letter. I have tools on hand on how I can manage my day-to-day -day challenges. Um, so that really helps. And and when push comes to shove, you can meet a counselor. You can meet a coach. You can go to HR, HR can then recommend other intervention techniques to make sure that you get um, the support that you need, right? And beyond this as well, uh, beyond intellect, if an organization has a strong mental wellness or employee wellness program, you know, you also um, offer other uh, initiatives such as physical well-being and all of these drives uh, work-life balance at the workplace. Thanks so much for sharing that. That actually reminds me heavily of what we started the, the day with. I think Antia actually shared, you know, the expectation of employees to workplaces, I, I think it was a stat of above 80% at, you know, are looking for such services in the workplace and they see that as essential to feeling supported as well. So I think it's exactly what you covered and, and thanks for sharing what you have encountered. Uh, I'd like to maybe invite Oliver yourself as well, you know, um, Lutfi, you, you've heard shared a bit about when, of, of course, the path to mental well-being and, you know, getting organizational results is not always the, the fastest, right? Let's be honest. Um, what would you have to, to share with, you know, any of our existing clients or future potential or anyone looking to embark on their own mental well-being programs uh, in terms of, you know, linking some of the results that they see from the program to organizational outcomes that leaders are looking for? So that's a great question, Frank. So ho my hope is that we're moving beyond our eye, actually, that we're looking more at value of investment and that we don't have to convince companies that, investing in the, in, in the staff's wellness and mental health is a very good investment. Now, the outcomes we see, um, so you're asking about the organizational outcomes that matter. Um, so not all companies care about the ROI, some do. And as I shared earlier, the, the motivation for the study was you know, to really convince people that this is a good investment. Um, many org outcomes like you know, what Lufti shared um, is, is around retention, but I think we're shifting more towards becoming more attractive as an employer, um, which is more sitting within the VOI, right? Um, staff, especially younger folks, they, they do their research. They, they, they know what a good mental wellness or mental health program looks like. They ask questions. I had it myself in some of the job interviews. Um, so that makes me think as a people leader as well, what can we do more to um, help companies to be attractive um, as employers. So yeah, I mean, the, the typical ones in the, if you recall the pyramid, the top one, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's around loyalties to the company, organizational citizenship. So do employees go the extra mile? It's closely linked to psychological safety. We, I think, saw that in Antia's um, talk as well. People who feel safe, they're just more, I mean, it goes without saying, right? They're more motivated. Um, you know, work is such a big part of what we do, our identity. So if we feel safe with our managers, then we come to work. I think it's those those uh, variables that make people feel safe in the company, um, want to come to work and be committed. Um, yeah. Thanks, Oliver. I think that's, that's really insightful. As the value on investment, that is mm -hmm. something we hope to want to come to, but of course, lots of data already for the days. Apologies. I think this may not be working, but can we go to slide down? So that actually is a perfect Please to maybe launch into my next question. I'll, I'll just share as we are moving the slides. Um, so this is for Hina, right? And again, back to the work with clients, we talked a bit about how we, um, I think at Pacific Prime started to bring that process in and you know, the one size does not fit all approach. Now, I guess what about post implementation, right? What kind of challenges do you see that your clients may face when interpreting their employee well-being results? Sure, Frank. This is the hot topic, right, Dr. Oliver? Uh, challenge is ROI calculation. So calculating return on investment um, is challenging. And especially if I have clients, they, want, they are looking for ROI in the first year of launch. It's, and they're just um, actually going for EAP services. You will not have that. So, so that's the first challenge making them understand the presentism cost, uh, the productivity loss. It's very, very difficult. And especially there's no benchmark data relevant to Singapore market. So that's one thing uh, we have come to notice. 
And the second thing is um, low engagement rate uh, in a wellness program can skew up the data. So how you constantly work on getting the high participation rate, because it might start uh, with a jiffy with good participation rate, but constantly maintaining that um, rate is challenging. Thanks, Mr. Chang. Both really great points, right? So I'd like to move into our last part of the panel and invite Dr. Oliver first to share. You know, we heard a lot about what you have done so far, the amazing research and data your, your team has produced. Now, maybe I'd like to take a step forward and help our clients, partners over here think about, you know, in the future, what potential research could we do um, that would enable them to continue approaching their well-being programs more effectively? So maybe a bit about the next six or 12 months, if, if you will. Can, can. Um, so just following on um, what Hina just shared, so one big area is benchmarking because that's a real need. Many organizations, they want to know how do I compare? We always seems to be a human need, right? We want to compare ourselves and we want to compare organizations. So, so benchmarking is huge and we're already working on that. Um, secondly, um, we're working closely with insurers and I'm much looking forward to continue um, the conversation we had earlier. So we're also looking at um, how much proactive mental health caretaking reduces the risk for um, clinical need um, because that's also a need. And we're looking at also at health outcomes. So does taking care of your mental health also reduces claims and improves your physical health? I mean, again, it should be quite obvious, right? If you're in better mental shape, um, well, you know, stress is linked to cardio risk. So we're going to live happier, longer lives. So that's, that's the other area as well. Um, and then we, we continue with the efficacy studies. As we innovate our solution, we always put things to the test. Thanks, Oliver. So I think that's a perfect way to move into our final question. As you know, I think the, the two of you, Hina, Ludfi, have had a chance to hear from Dr. Oliver, and I appreciate that we did give you a lot of uh, preview about this, the slides that he shared as well. We'd love to get maybe a closing thought from, from both of you about you know, what you've heard and any initial sort of thoughts, responses, or areas that you thought you could take away for your personal or professional work. This time, maybe we'll start with Lutfi first. Lutfi. Sure. Um, thank you for the presentation earlier. And, and I was thinking about you know, how I could use this for 2024. Um, and I saw two use cases, right? And first one is validating whatever HR is trying to do for the employee population. Uh, we have a host of uh, intervention or mediation um, strategies uh, for our employees whenever they face mental challenges, whenever they are facing mental illnesses. Um, and more often than not, uh, we get questioned. You know, why, why do I need to speak to a counselor? Why do I need to speak to a coach? Um, how does doing this thing on the intellect app helps me with uh, managing stress? So having this scientific data helps to validate why uh, HR are pushing for these activities for our employee groups. So I think that's really helpful. Um, and, and the second one is a little bit more proactive. Um, I think um, as much as uh, your data is science-backed, um, a lot of organizations also want to see how that affects ourselves internally, right? So um, I could use, um, we could do sample trials even within our organization, within teams um, on how the utilization of um, whether it's an intellect or other uh, employee wellness initiatives um, have a direct positive correlation to productivity. Uh, we have productivity measurements in the organization um, and now having this uh, clear ROIs, we could then use that samples and show that, hey, you know what, this is your external data, but even internally, this works. Um, and I think that, again, validates whatever we're trying to do for the larger good of the company. Thanks, Lucy. I mean, one thing I love working with you and the team is always that you're always pushing us, right? As a client to a, to a partner, I think we are always having to take a one, two, three steps ahead. And, and because of your, of course, progressiveness when you look at the space. Thanks, and Ishina, over to you as well. I was thinking, I was thinking in points, what I could share with the, I mean, our team can share with clients the clinical insight, um, the ROI calculation, strategies, how to boost employees' productivity. So what this will do, it will help our clients to make data-driven decisions for effective mental health solutions. Thanks, Ina. Again, Hina, Lutfi, and Oliver, thanks so much for being on this panel. Really appreciate it. We have one more panel coming up just before lunch. Uh, I'll leave uh, Cassandra to introduce. But again, uh, appreciate everyone's time. And back to you, Cassandra. <laughs>